think I'm, I'm just liking this series more and more where you guys come and you speak and we get to because you think more about it when you teach it and it helps all of us to have a clearer understanding. Well, we have, we have uh, all agreed that Pentecost is the coming of the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit is a third person. I like in one of the passages we read where Jesus said, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit is not going to come. I say, who knows why that is so? I have to go for the Holy Spirit to come. After all, they, they were in the same place. They were together in the in River Jordan. But the Holy Spirit was coming to take permanent precedence here on earth now. And Jesus had to go because Jesus is leaving. Means what? His assignment is over. He's finished his job. See, if he, if he did not go, it means he has not finished his job. And if he has not finished his own job, the Holy Spirit cannot come to start his own job. Jesus came to introduce the kingdom of God. When the job is finished, his leaving means what? He has gotten people, he has mandated people to carry on the assignment. He came to introduce the kingdom of God. That to reconcile creation back to God. And he gave that mandate to those of us who believe in him, starting with the 12 disciples that we had. And then he gave them the instructions, go and make disciples of all nations. And he said, okay, don't leave until you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, you will receive power. What is the purpose of that power? So that you will be witnesses unto me. Witnessing to Jesus is not just limited to the fact that we go out and we preach that Jesus is Lord. It's you something that will reflect in everything that we do. We should be, uh, people should be able to distinguish between believers in Jesus Christ and, the, and what is operational in the society in general. I was talking to uh, someone who was interviewing me uh, because I was used as a reference. And to, I don't know how we got into talking about politics. And I said, well, the person we're talking about, we have the same political view. And uh, some of the things that we have, because we're not very happy about the things that are, that are happening in the society right now. I said, that's why I want to run for president. <laughs> and she laughed. She said, well, good luck about that. So what do you mean? You mean I don't stand a chance? I said, no, I won't say so. <laughs> but every time I tell people that I want to run for president, they, 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 the first person that I share that with, he said, that, well, you can win, but how large is your family? <laughs> I said, I got a wife. And four kids. And somebody says, well, okay, you will need a little bit more than that. <laughs> because I know that at that time, I said, I know that none of my kids will vote for me. But, and I, I mean this with all seriousness. If I become the president of the United States of America, or president anywhere, really, the first thing that I will establish is that we're going to work on the principles of the Word of God. It's all going to be based on what says the Lord. If you don't want that, don't vote for me. If we cannot justify it on the basis of the Scriptures, we're not going to do it. So I might not live long as president, but if it pleases the Lord that I'm there, right, I, I promise that things will be very different. But when Jesus came, he came to introduce, to reconcile us back to God. He gave the assignment to all, and he declared when he was on the cross that what? 
it is finished. I have completed the assignment. So we know that he has finished his own job. He was about to leave, but he has now appointed associates who will carry on the responsibility of, re of reconciliation of man and God, introducing the kingdom of God to the whole world. That is our responsibility. Our responsibility goes beyond the building of a church. It goes beyond the majesty and the size of our building. It goes beyond the programs that we have in our, in our churches if they are not focused towards building the kingdom of Christ. And then he let, he let us know that he was not going to leave us alone. He was going to send us a helper. And on the day of Pentecost, in that day, the Holy Spirit came while they were in the upper world. So in this series, we see that the, the doctrine of the Trinity is established because it has pleased God to organize himself into an economy for us to fulfill certain functions so that the perfect will of God will be established and executed on mankind, his creation. So all the argument about well, you will not be written on these theology books written by uh, the forefathers, people like Athanasius, uh, people like uh, Augustine of Hippo, Justin Martyr, uh, 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 Polycarp. You will not believe some of the arguments that they had. The, the, all the things that they had to declare as heresy. What is the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? I will, I will not bore you with, 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 with all that details. But it, was, it is interesting to see that even at that time, they didn't agree. Some believe that, well, there is subordination in that organization. That is, one person is higher than the other. That the Father is the highest, and Jesus is next, and then the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so we will believe in that uh, uh, only because uh, adoption policy that Jesus who just came he was an ordinary man, but then God adopted him at his uh, at his uh, baptism and, and made him his son. So all kinds of heresies just flew around. There are those who say that. There are no three persons, just one person. They call that uh, Sabellism. So and those who are still preaching, preaching that till today. But it doesn't really matter. If you believe, because there is no one single human being that is able to say that, okay, I understand fully the constitution of the Trinity. I know how the Father relates to the Son. I know how the Son relates to the Holy Spirit. I know how they have been from the very beginning. All we know that they are all eternal. All we know that they have all the all the all three have divine nature. All we know is that they are three distinct personalities. So how do you explain that? All kinds of metaphors have been used to try to describe it. Some people say, oh, grandma, you can think about uh, Trinity like water. And water exists in, uh, as water, as, uh, as ice, and then as steam. But that, uh, that metaphor fell apart because water, steam, and ice, and they don't have the same nature. They, can love, they, they have to change in nature. There, there been all kinds of metaphors and descriptions have been used to try to describe them. We don't know it fully, but we know the, what we hold up, what we believe very strongly is that that is still one God. We don't have three gods. 
So now we, we have a situation where we believe very strongly in the person of the Holy Spirit. It is not just a force because there is a denomination. I think it is several the Adventists or uh, uh, Jehovah Witnesses that believe that the Holy Spirit is just a force from God. It's just the power of God that is being uh, exercised on earth. But it's more than that. It's a distinct personality. Because we know that he was grieved. We know that he can be uh, um, uh, disappointed. We know that he interacted with people. We know, we know that he exhibited emotions. And we, we know that he is divine. He's a personality that, that exists on his own. But the, all three, they make up the Godhead and we have only one God. So we, we know that the Holy Spirit has done, has always been with God, just like Jesus has always been. We saw the, the functions of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. At creation, he was there. I'm not going to go through because the Bible tells us about the Spirit of God over over the waters. Yeah? See, if, if Gabriel was here, he would have helped me along with some of those things. You guys are just looking at me. <laughs> and, uh, at creation, the Holy Spirit was there. In the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 19, when God, you see that God appeared to Abraham, he saw three men coming. But when they got to Abraham, they spoke as one, one person. I said, and God said to Abraham, will I hide from you what I, what I, I was about to do? But then Abraham said to God. So God, Abraham saw three people coming towards him, but when they spoke, they spoke at one person. So we, we knew, we, we saw him demonstrated there. And now uh, we already talked about the baptism of Christ in River Jordan, where we saw distinctly the three persons of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we know that uh, when Ananias and Sapphira uh, lied, Peter said, why have you chosen to lie to the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts chapter 5? And when we heard that, he fell down and he died immediately. So the Holy Spirit has also been promised to us from, from the Old Testament times for a, for a long time. Maybe in the passage of the world you dealt with, there are several places where we, uh, we can touch upon. But the book of Joel, chapter 2, that one is enough for us, 28, 32. So I see God promised that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I'm worried about the, the promises of Jesus in the book of John and in Acts, chapter 1. Why was that promise necessary? Why did he make the pastor we've been seeing the Holy Spirit functioning? Because at that time, the Holy Spirit, God worked with people and gave them the Holy Spirit when he wanted them to perform certain functions. He would empower them with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit did not dwell on them permanently. He will be with them to perform that function and they will and then depart from there. So when God said I will pour it out, means that he will be upon you permanently. Like he is right now. Examples in the Old Testament time, the person of Othniel, the judge Othniel in, in Judges chapter 3, and also by Gideon in Judges chapter 6, Samson also, David. So we saw the, the, form, the Holy Spirit functioning in the lives of people. Even Jesus himself, he had to experience the indwelling, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When did it happen to him? When he was baptized. That's why he was able to walk into the, into the synagogue in Luke chapter 4. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me with power. The same power he promised his disciples in the 
book of Acts chapter 1. So we know that it is the Holy Spirit that, that empowers. We can very, very quickly um, go to uh, the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, the purposes of the Holy Spirit, we've talked upon one. The, enable, uh, the Holy Spirit enables us to obey God. You can, you can uh, confess yourself as a Christian and be going to church diligently, but you can live a carnal lifestyle. Not that you don't want to obey God, it's just that the things of the world will be too attractive to you for you to abandon them. It is, the only, it is only the Holy Spirit that brings that conviction that we read this morning. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict you of what? Of sin. It takes only the conviction of the Holy Spirit for us to know how to obey God, not only to understand that this is what pleases God, but he also empowers us to overcome the organs of the of the for, uh, the things of the flesh. Ezekiel thirty six twenty seven says, "I will put my spirit in you, so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations." Even that's also from the Old Testament times. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. He is the revealer uh, of truth to us. John 14, that we go to 15 to 20. Uh, give, the Bible tells us that Jesus promised, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never lead you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. See, the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. People trying to argue the veracity of the scriptures with an unbeliever is an exercise in futility. If you are trying to argue the Bible with someone who is not a Christian, who is not born again, who does not have the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us that the things of the, of, of the Bible are only spiritual and can help. They can only be spiritually understood. It is the only, only the Holy Spirit can teach, bring out the truth of the Scripture, bring that conviction into a, a person's heart, and they will know for sure that yes. This is the truth. So this is the true word of God. If you look at it, thank God for internet nowadays. You look at uh, some of the arguments that Muslims bring up to, <laughs> to discount the, the Bible. You will just laugh because they bring up all kinds of silly stuff. They say, okay, they say, the Bible says that. Ah, ah. Just say that there was no light. To tell you how wrong the Bible is, they are proving the Bible wrong now. See, you see that? Uh, let, let there be light, and there was light. And then the Bible says later on that God invented the sun and the moon. If there was no sun and the moon, where did God get the light from? <laughs> they, they, have, they, will, they will just say all kinds of silly stuff that they, they don't understand. When God, the Bible says God Himself is light. <laughs> From the very beginning, <laughs> God Himself is light. Every revelation of Christ that people have seen, where He has chosen to reveal Himself to mankind, what is the first thing that they notice? An immense light. That's the first thing they experience. They say, they, they, they will not even be able to describe the nature of the light. They will say, it is so bright. How can someone who is light himself 
Now say he needs the sun or he needs uh, 24 watts of electricity. <laughs> the, 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 it takes the Holy Spirit to open their eyes. Then the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches. In 1 John chapter 2, 26 to 27, I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. And there are all kinds of abundant teachings on the internet now that you gotta be careful. You see, in 27, verse 27 says, But you have received the Holy Spirit. And he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what he teaches is true. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. You try to bring out some points to some people today. And they will argue with you. It will not make sense to them because the Bible says that the word of God is like what? Foolishness unto those that perish. It is the Holy Spirit that teaches the true word of God and interprets it into our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the one that empowers for ministry. We already understand this from our previous discussion. We understand how people like Gideon, Samson, David, even Simeon, what, even at Pentecost, you know how the disciples were kind of hiding in the upper room until they received the Holy Spirit. All of, all of a sudden, they became totally different people. One sermon, and Simon, that Simon preached, and 3,000 people joined the church in one day. Or if we let the Holy Spirit work, even in this small city of Crystal City, we'll be surprised as to what can happen. See, how does the Holy Spirit do? How does it work? It works by giving us gifts. We know about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11, we talk, talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, brothers and sisters, we can see how important the Holy Spirit is to us as believers. I believe there are certain things that are holding back the work of the church. I believe, number one, that we don't, we have not gotten the mission right. We think our job is to build a church and have as many members as possible come every Sunday and fill up our fields and we start talking about expanding the world. It doesn't make any difference if the same group of people come, if they go from church to come, as soon as we have a big church and we can talk, we can talk about having thousands of people coming. So we're not concerned about the state of the hearts of those people. I remember one of the sermons of uh, Pastor Adeboe, the general overseer, he said at one meeting at the camp in Lagos, if you go to those camp meetings, at, at times there will be over a million people there. He said they had this uh, Holy Ghost service. And there were hundreds of thousands of people there, and he was so happy, he was so content. And he was saying, oh, thank you, Lord, that I have so many members in my church. <laughs> and the Lord said, what are you happy about? If I come now, less than 300 people will go with me in this church. He said, he said ye paripa. You know what ye paripa means? Oh, my goodness. I have more than 3,000 pastors, and yet only 300 people will go. We have missed the mission. The mission is for us to go and make disciples. The mission is not for us to be church members. The mission for us is not to say, I'll make heaven and that's it. 
we are here to work for the kingdom. We are ambassadors of Christ. That's our daily job. Whatever else we do to make a living is just an avocation. Paul was a tent maker. Peter was a fisherman. Yes, they had things that they did for a living, so they will not be a burden to other people. But the daily, the Bible tells us daily, the apostles went from house to house preaching the gospel. Daily, they met as believers. That is our job. We have walked away from that. Another thing that I think is holding back the church, which is the primary thing, is that we are not paying enough attention to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. We are the God of the Holy Spirit. How many sermons do we give on Sunday to the Holy Spirit? How many times do we invite the Holy Spirit? Uh, it's, it is even funny. Sometimes we pray and say, Holy Spirit, take control. The Holy Spirit was not sent to come and take control of your church. The Holy Spirit was sent to do what? To help us. Jesus called him an advocate, a comforter. You have to tell the Holy Spirit what you want to do and then ask for his help. Hello, someone. I didn't see anybody go, Amen, Hallelujah. Amen, hallelujah. <laughs> it's too late. So, <laughs> you have to do it before I ask them. Okay. <laughs> so we, if we can take care of those these, those two things. Jesus said, we will do greater things than he did. The third person of the Holy Spirit of the Trinity is extremely important to our mission as ambassadors of Christ. I pray that we will be empowered. I pray that uh, we will recognize the importance of being empowered by the Holy Spirit. I pray that uh, we will fulfill our mission, the purpose for which God brought us into this world, to the glory of his name. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, uh, because you are our teacher. We really rely on you. Oh Lord, every time we come together, that is why we take the time to uh, observe this day which we call the Pentecost Day, where we are celebrating the day you came into the world to reside permanently on this world for our purposes. Lord, we just want to say thank you. We are praying in the mighty name of Jesus that we will be conscious of you being in us and around us all the time will be conscious that you're waiting for us to give you instructions of what to do uh, so that we will fulfill the mission of building the kingdom of Christ. You will wake up the body of Christ that for, from this slumber, from this stupor that we are in uh, so that uh, we will be ready when he comes back. Just to give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. I just want to do a final word to those of you out there who still have doubts about the person of about the person of Jesus Christ and the function of the Holy Spirit. You might say you believe in God and you serve Him and you pray to Him. If you do not have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will not make it to heaven. The world, there is no works of righteousness that will be justified before God. It takes only the blood of Jesus. It takes only the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for you to do the will of God. And if you feel you're not deprecating any religion, 
we are not advocating that we are superior to other people. We are just messengers giving you the message from God. And for what God is doing now, nobody will have any excuse to stand before him and say, I did not know. Because he is taking people from every religion, from every walk of life, doctors um, and uh, construction workers, nurses and teachers, housewives, and show them heaven. Show them hell. The only person they meet there is Jesus Christ. Now, if so, if that is the case, don't you think it's just common sense for you to make sure that you are right with Jesus? I pray that you will be concerned about your own eternity. Because no matter how long you live here on earth, it's nothing compared to eternity. Someone was trying to describe it in eternity compared to our life here. He said, uh, you just go to the, to the ocean and you look at all the sand on earth, uh, on, the, on, on the seashore, and then you take one grain of sand and you said, okay, I'm going to keep this grain for a thousand years. Then I'll say one, and then you take another grain of sand. I wait to thousand, another thousand years, I say two. Say that he said that one grain is compared to the whole grain of sand out there. It's like our life here compared to eternity. It's forever. If you make the mistake of not making the kingdom of God you will be in eternal punishment for the rest of eternity. And there is no excuse for it. God has done everything in his power to make sure that we all come to heaven with him. Don't miss that opportunity. Don't let Satan deceive you. Don't let the world deceive you. Don't let religion deceive you. Irrespective of what you call yourself right now, Get right with Jesus. He is the only way. He is the truth and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through him. I pray that you, you will listen. Praise God. It's our custom.